Well, good morning and welcome to the worship of God here at Linden Baptist Church. We are glad that you have joined us this morning as we gather together to hear the story of God's great love for us and to uh, sing praises to God and, and offer our thanksgiving to God, uh, to give to God our lives and to uh, seek to hear from God uh, as God continues to instruct us and teach us uh, how to be the disciples of Jesus Christ uh, in this world. So we are glad that you have joined us for worship this day, and we pray that uh, as we sing and pray and we read Scripture and we listen to God speak to us, uh, that all of us will be open to the changing power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. If this is the first time uh, that you have joined us for worship, know that we are very, very glad to have you with us. Uh, and pray that uh, you, you will be enriched and blessed in the presence of God uh, this day. And, and hope that we'll be able to meet you uh, personally at some time in the future or, or through the, the miracle of email and Twitter and Facebook, uh, we might be able to meet you and get to know you uh, as well. But welcome to worship this day as we offer our lives to the God who loves us beyond all measure. And as we begin our worship, I invite us to begin to draw our attention uh, to God uh, into God's voice as we read together from Psalm 85. Let me hear what the Lord God will speak. For God, God will speak, speak to, to the, the people, people, to the, to the faithful, faithful, to those who turn to God in their, in their hearts. hearts. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who fear the Lord, that God's glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before the Lord and will make a path for God's steps. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Show, Show my feet where, where the righteous, righteous walk. walk. Protect, Protect me from evil and prod me, me to fight, fight for justice. justice. Guide, Guide me past temptation and compel, compel me to help, help someone, someone in need. need. Your word is a light to my path. Light my, my path, path when, when I, I have, have to walk, walk alone through dark, dark alleys, empty, empty parking lots, lots and, and deserted, deserted streets. streets. When we are afflicted, give us life, Lord. Give, give us, us life when misery dulls our souls. Give, give us life when sorrow swallows hope. 
Give us us life when when persecution persecution humbles humbles sanity. sanity. Accept our offering of praise, Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord. Lord. Lamp Lamp to my my feet, feet. light to my path, path. giver Giver of life. life. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to the worship service here at Linden Baptist Church. Truly, God's word is a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet. God is leading us and guiding us through this life. And we see in the scriptures often that the disciples of Jesus had only a little faith. And so Jesus was doing wonders and miracles in their midst and teaching them uh, what it means to truly have faith in him and to have faith in God. So today we proclaim God's word. We're going to do it through preaching, through singing, through praying, through the reading of the scriptures to remind us once again of the great works that God has done in the lives of the faithful and to remind us of the works that God's done in our own lives. So today we sing, um, each one of us, as if we had a thousand tongues. And we'll sing that hymn, A Thousand Tongues to Sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of pray together. O oh God, who calls us to your work in this world, who gives us the gift of your presence through the Holy Spirit to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We come this morning recognizing and confessing our need for you. For we know that in our own strength, We cannot do what you have called us to do. 
We know that in our own wisdom, we are not wise enough to discern the ways that you are working in this world and that you would have us to work. We recognize that we do not have enough sight, that our ears are not sharp enough to hear everything that you would have us see and hear. And so we come to you this morning seeking your wisdom, seeking your strength, seeking your sight, seeking your listening ears so that we may not only hear you, but that we may hear the cries of our neighbors in this world. And in hearing and in seeing, we may know how to respond in the ways that you would have us to. To continue your reconciling, healing, repairing work in this world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. We know that God is for us, not against us. We know that God is with us and hasn't deserted us. But it's hard during difficult times when we're surrounded by loss and despair, when there's trials and persecutions in our life. It's hard to find that faith that we have inside of ourselves to trust in the grace of God. And we say, if only Jesus were here to do mighty works like he did for the disciples, maybe then and we could trust him more. But we see even when he was in their midst, they didn't always trust him enough. So in the scriptures, God directs Elijah to watch for him. And he doesn't see God in the thunder or in the wind or in the fire, but he hears God in the stillness. So this morning, I encourage you to still the voices that are always rattling around inside of you, worried about the day. Clear your mind and hear from God. We'll sing together, Be Still My Soul.
confession, a time when we seek to bring all of our desires, all of our thoughts, uh, all of our attitudes uh, into line with God's will for this world and God's will for us. So I invite you to join with me uh, in this time of confession. God makes no distinctions among us. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous. Indeed, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Confessing our sins, we depend upon God's generosity and grace. Will you pray with me? Gracious, Gracious God, God, you call, call us to step, step out in faith, faith trusting, trusting in you for all things. things. We, we respond, respond to, to your, your command. command but then sink in doubt and fear. We hide from the challenges of bold discipleship. We are not able to fulfill your commandments, for our purposes are never in full accord with yours. Forgive us, we pray, when we confess with our lips, but do not believe in our hearts. Help us to practice our faith in all circumstances. Lift us out of sin into the arms of your mercy. Though we are distracted by noise all around, allow us to hear your voice, even when it is the sound of sheer silence. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our God is faithful. Our God is gracious. Our God is merciful. And as the scriptures have already reminded us, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Know that this day we live under the faithful love of God. And so may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Our next hymn is a very famous one. It is well with my soul. And Horatio Spafford wrote this hymn after losing his family in a tragic boat accident. And so you hear a lot of um, allusions to the wind and the waves, the sea billows roll, and that despite the great sorrow and loss he had gone through, he was still fulfilled in knowing Jesus Christ, his Savior, the same God who calmed the wind and the waves when he walked upon them, the same God who could do that then for some reason um, didn't save Spafford's family from the ocean, in these days, we know that God saves us from much more than um, an ocean. God saves us from death itself. When we know Jesus Christ, we can be with him uh, forever. 
And so it's in the fullness of Christ that we live and experience this life in the midst of loss and trouble. So let's sing um, the words, it is well with my soul, and pray, as our confession said, that that could also be the words of our heart.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us as your scriptures are read. Bring your understanding and reveal your truth. Open our minds, hearts, and souls to all these words of life offered us. We long to be continually challenged, transformed and renewed by your word. May we hear your voice of life as we read and draw close to you. Amen. A reading from 1 Kings. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Japheth, and Ephelmethoth, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the Lord of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. A reading from Romans. Moses writes, concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one who believes with the heart and is so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We'll join together in singing Lift Him Up as we read from the gospel this morning. We'll raise our hands as we sing. 
Gospel of Matthew. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory and honor and power and might, now and forever. Amen. great miracle has been performed. Jesus has fed over 5,000 people from five loaves of bread and two fish. And immediately Jesus put his disciples in a boat while he dismisses the crowd and heads to the hills to pray. While Jesus is praying, a great storm on the sea begins to batter and torture the boat. The disciples struggle for hours with all they've got to keep the boat afloat. A great miracle has been performed. At God's instruction, Elijah has faced off against 400 prophets of Baal to determine who is the God in Israel. The prophets of Baal and Elijah each were to build an altar to their God. The winner of this winner-take-all contest would be the one whose God would send fire to light the altar. At the end of the day, Elijah triumphs, and the 400 prophets of Baal are put to death. A great miracle, but not so fast. Queen Jezebel, who had brought the worship of Baal into the royal court, threatens to exterminate Elijah in retribution for the death of her prophets. Elijah runs to the hills for his life. He figures his life is over. Nothing remains but to lay down and die. A great miracle takes place. Peter, recognizing Jesus walking on the water, asks Jesus to allow him to join Jesus on the sea. With one word, come. Jesus invites Peter to walk with him on the water. 
Peter leaves the precarious safety of the boat and begins to walk toward Jesus on the very waves that threatened the boat and its passengers. Shortly after beginning his excursion on the stormy sea, Peter becomes aware of the howling wind. You, you know that kind of wind, the wind that slows your steps, the wind that threatens to push you back as you walk, the kind of wind that you have to lean into in order to make headway. Peter panics and begins to sink. The word there literally means drown which means Peter's head was actually sinking below the waves, the waves that he had just been walking on top of. In each of these instances, the great work of God is followed by a threat to the very lives of those who participated in it. Their destruction seems inevitable. Yet in each of these instances, the story is not complete. Elijah travels a day's journey into the wilderness, sits down under a broom tree, and asks God, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. He saw what he had done as a failure. Sure, he had triumphed over the prophets of Baal, but it had not made much of a difference in the actual situation on the ground in Israel. Jezebel was still queen. She still exerted power in Israel and over her husband, the king. Elijah interprets the situation through the lens of his own failure. So he deserves to die. But God doesn't see things that way. God isn't finished with Elijah. Angels come twice and encourage him to eat so he would have strength for the journey to Mount Horeb. The food the angels provided Elijah sustained him for 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, God shows up. I wonder why it took God so long to show up. Why did God leave Elijah alone in a cave on Mount Horeb for nearly 40 days? Why was God absent for so long in the midst of Elijah's pain and struggle? What was this a test of some sort? When God does show up, he asks Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? And Elijah spins his tale of the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Woe is me, Elijah mourn, moans. I'm the only faithful person left in Israel. Then God instructs Elijah to step outside the cave because God was getting ready to pass by. That is, God is getting ready to make himself known to Elijah. When in the whisper, God speaks to Elijah God commissions Elijah to go back to Israel and finish the work that he had begun on Mount Carmel. And not only to defeat the prophets of Baal, but to defeat all the enemies of God. In the gospel text, the disciples have been sent by Jesus in a boat onto the Sea of Galilee. He sends them out without him. A storm arises. They are weary, their strength is almost spent, and they fear for their lives. It is said that John F. Kennedy has the old Breton prayer inscribed on a block of wood on his desk. The poem by Winfred Ernest Garrison surely summed up the disciples' feelings as they struggled with the storm. Thy sea, O God, so great, my boat so small, it cannot be that any happy fate will me befall, save as thy goodness opens paths for me through the consuming vastness of the sea. And all of a sudden, Jesus, or something else, someone else shows up. Who? What, what is this? Immediately, the disciples begin to speculate it must be a demon. After all, no human being walks on water. So it must be one of the demons of the sea. You see, they believed that the sea was full of demons in the water. The panic grows. Has the devil come for them? Is this the way their lives are going to end? Being dragged into the deep by a demon of the sea? Into the fear 
Jesus speaks. Have courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now Matthew records that this hardly diminishes their fear. You see, when the Son of God or when God shows up, fear is a natural response. You will recall that Job, as well as the writer of Ecclesiastes, learned that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And Garrison's prayer continues. Thy winds, O God, so strong, so slight my sail. How I curb and bit them on the long and sultry trail, unless thy love were mightier than the wrath of all the tempests that beset my path. When Jesus does eventually get into the boat with them, the storm subsides and the sea grows calm. And yet their response is not celebration, but awe-filled worship. Matthew tells us that right there, right there in the boat, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, the disciples began to worship Jesus, proclaiming, truly, you are the Son of God. And Garrison's prayer concludes, Thy world, O God, so fierce, and I so frail, yet though its arrows threaten oft to pierce my fragile mail, cities of refuge rise where dangers cease, sweet silences abound, and all is peace. Had Jesus sent them out on the sea to test their faith? Why had Jesus waited so long to come to them after the storm rose on the sea? Why didn't he jump right in and save them when the danger first arose? Had Jesus wanted them to learn the lesson of the feeding of the 5,000 plus people? That God would provide in the hour of need. That God would provide despite our lack of resources. Was Jesus trying to teach them that they had something to do in the work of the kingdom of God? There is a mystery here. And then there's Peter. His words to Jesus are ambiguous. Did he really believe that the one speaking to him was indeed Jesus? Or was he asking for proof? In other words, was Jesus saying, if you are who you say you are, prove it to me by allowing me to do the impossible? You see, the testimony of Scripture is that only God can walk on water. No demon could empower Peter to do what Peter asked. Only Jesus could make that happen. Or did Peter recognize Jesus straight out? And therefore, was Peter being his normal, audacious, impetuous self, wanting to take risks for the sake of the one he loved more than any other? Whatever his motive, Peter asked to join Jesus on the roiling waves. And Jesus, amazingly enough, says, come. Without that invitation, Peter would not have gotten out of the boat. Matthew wants us to understand that Peter did not get out of the boat and walk on water on his own. Only the empowerment of God's call would enable Peter to do the impossible. This was not Peter's work. This was God's work. So Peter steps out and begins to walk on the water. A great miracle. Then his attention is diverted by the howling wind and he begins to drown calling out to Jesus, Lord, save me, one can almost hear the echoes of Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. In response to Peter's plea, Jesus stretches out his hand towards Peter and pulls Peter up out of the water. And then admonishes him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Clarence Jordan in his Cotton Patch versions renders Jesus' words this way, Why did you lose your nerve, baby faith? The answer to the question is inherent in the answer. Peter's fear of danger overcomes his trust 
in Jesus. You see, doubt is not intellectual questioning so much as it is a division of our loyalty, a, div a double-mindedness in a sense. And here, Peter is not questioning whether Jesus is some theological great teacher as much as he questions the power of Jesus over the power of the storm. When Peter did that, the storm got the better of him. His fear got in the way of his faith. This is what keeps Peter from believing that he is anything other than a human being who on his own would sink in the stormy sea. Yet Peter will learn that even in his failure to maintain focus, to maintain discipline, Jesus reaches out to deliver him. While he won't be delivered from the storm, notice Jesus doesn't calm the water for Peter. Jesus does teach him that no harm will come to him. At the same time, Peter surely learns that faith requires concentration and single-minded discipline on his part. Getting out of the boat was a crazy idea, even if there had been no storm. Yet it seems that Peter models for the church the way of discipleship, to move beyond the relative safety of the boat and join Jesus on the stormy seas of the world. As one writer has suggested, if the church is not willing to get out of the relative safety of the boat, then we condemn the world to being tossed about on the stormy seas of economic and political oppression. We condemn people to the potential drowning in their addictions and violence. If we are not willing to join Jesus in the so-called dangerous places in our world, we may remain relatively safe, but we condemn the world to certain death. In both the gospel and the Old Testament passages today, the disciples and the prophet have witnessed great acts of God only to immediately be thrown into difficult and trying situations. In both instances, the faith of disciples and the prophet falter and they are on the verge of giving up. In both instances, God appears to remind them of who they are and of what their role is in God's work in the world. And in doing so, God reminds them, as God reminds us, that God will not abandon us. But now thus says the Lord, prophesies Isaiah, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And you are my witnesses. Amen. And amen. One of the great narratives in all of Scripture is the call of God into the lives of people. God called Elijah to be a prophet. God called the disciples in that boat to be his disciples. God called Paul, whose letter we read from earlier, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Throughout the scriptures, God's calling people, sometimes groups of people, sometimes individuals of people. God calls us to join God in God's work in this world. If you're worshiping with us this morning and you have never answered the call of Jesus Christ on your life, the fundamental call of Jesus Christ on your life to come and follow me, to come and learn from me, to come and find life in me, 
we extend to you the invitation this day to give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, to turn your life over to his hands so that he can begin the wonderful work of grace in your life to reform and remake you into the very image that God created in you in the beginning. If that is your desire this morning to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to know what it means that God will never abandon you. And even in the difficulties and the storms of life, God is with you. And that God has called you to something more than the existence that the world offers you. We would love to be able to help you on that journey. If that is your desire and that is your commitment this day, we would encourage you to contact us so that we may pray with you, that we may uh, talk with you, that we may walk with you, that we may help you find ways to enter into this journey of discipleship. And if not us, we encourage you to find a church close to you that can help you begin this walk as a disciple of Jesus. Perhaps all of us, uh, many of us who have been Christians for a long time uh, have realized that the concerns of the world and the storms of life take, have more power over us than does the power of God in Jesus Christ. And we need this day to refocus. We need to recommit ourselves to Jesus. And that is the invitation we offer to you today, too. All of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ, all of us who seek to be a part of God's work in this world, are invited by the Lord Jesus Christ to give. To give of everything that we have. To give of our bodies, to give of our minds, to give of our souls, to give of our our physical resources, to give of our financial resources in order to help in the work of God to go on all over this world. We are God's witnesses. And that witness takes all that we have. So this morning we invite you to give of yourself, to give of your resources to the mission of God in this world. Will you pray with me? We thank you, Lord, that you walk with us on the stormy sea of life. We thank you, Lord, that you accompany us on the journey from the places we try to hide from life back into the midst of trouble and strife and conflict in order to bear witness to your great design and plan for this world. We commit ourselves to you anew and afresh this day. We offer to you all that we have and all that we are. And we pray that where we are, that you will use us to do your work, to offer your grace and healing. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Each week we offer a prayer of intercession, bringing to mind the concerns we have for family and friends, the praises we have for the ways in which we have seen God at work in our lives. This is a special week, a challenging week for many people in our city and in our nation because schools are reopening. Some have already reopened. Some will be coming into buildings and gathering in person. Some will be working from home. 
There are challenges in each situation. And today, as we pray, I invite you to especially remember the students, the teachers, the administrators, the families who are involved this week and in the coming weeks, involved in getting students back into school in the midst of a continuing pandemic. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our Father, you are our creator, <clears throat> our sustainer, and our ever-present help. We offer our lives to you. We voice our petitions to you for our church, for our families, and for our world. Hear our prayer. Have mercy on us. Guide us as we share your message of love and grace to a world in need of healing and restoration. As your church in the Linden community and across the world, we pray for courage in the face of adversity. We ask your healing touch, your guidance, the comfort of your spirit in the face of the pandemic and the interruptions it has brought to the lives of all of us, but especially in the lives where the COVID-19 illness has interrupted the ability to work. It's interrupted the health it has caused long-term hospitalizations and death. Lord, we do seek to see the world through your eyes, especially in the realities of the injustices that have been unveiled to us. That the curtain that has been covering our eyes is being drawn back and that you would guide and direct us as we bear witness and be the reconciling work of your spirit among your people. That our lives and our words and our relationships will point others to Christ. We lift in prayer today our world praying especially for the leaders as they face challenges, for those who are in communities that have been upended by natural disasters of wind and rain, the devastation of buildings that have exploded, the lives that have been transformed in a moment. May they seek your wisdom and your guidance. May they work toward the healing and restoration of all people under their leadership. We do pray for each of those leaders. We are at a time in our year when schools are resuming, when classrooms are being opened, and the excitement and energy of a new school year is in the air, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of the fears that are raised, with the reality that school won't look the same. So we lift to you the school administrators and personnel that as they consider safety for all, that the policies and procedures would be well thought out. We ask your preparation on each child, each student, the families as they gather supplies the homes where preparations will be made for instruction at home, 
that considerations for safety would be, would be at the top of everyone's list. Guide, direct, give voice to concerns. And may this be a school year where students learn even in spite of the challenges that are being faced. Lord, we are also aware of many among our family and our friends in our communities who are facing physical illness, some from the pandemic, many from long-term illnesses, others from short-term illnesses and surgeries. We lift each to you. Touch their lives, touch their bodies, that they would be restored. Lord, for each one who provides care, may your gentle touch be evident through the way in which they reach out and they offer care to those who are who are in their under their care. Lord, there are many in our world who are grieving. They're grieving for the death of family and friends. They're grieving the loss of security as finances and homes are not the stable, secure places, the stable, secure realities that people live with. As they grieve, Lord, may they feel your presence, guide and direct. It is in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, that we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we prepare to conclude this part of our worship this day, um, let me remind you of opportunities that you have uh, in the coming days to uh, be a part of st Bible study, uh, to be a part of fellowship. Uh, we are online in a variety of ways. On Tuesday afternoon at 1.30, uh, we have a Bible study uh, on Facebook Live. Uh, this Tuesday, we start a study of the book of Esther. Uh, then on Thursdays, Larice leads a Bible study uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit um, and invite you to join in on that. That's Thursday afternoons at 2.30. On uh, Wednesday evening at 6.30, uh, we have uh, a devotional service um, that follows a time of fellowship. Uh, on Zoom, we gather together for our Wednesday night dinner. And if you'd like to be a part of just being able to talk to somebody, be able to share your life, share your story, see somebody's faces and, and laugh a little bit. Uh, we invite you to be a part of that fellowship time. And then, of course, on Sunday mornings at 930, we also do Bible study at the traditional Sunday school. Uh, we do that by Zoom as well right now. And uh, if you'd like to be a part of any of those Zoom uh, meetings, um, then please let us know uh, so we can send to you an invitation. For those of you that are members of Linden Baptist Church, uh, you remember that at our congregational meeting in July, we actually adjourned that meeting until August the 12th. That's this coming Wednesday. So this coming Wednesday at uh, 545, again, by way of Zoom, uh, we will be continuing our congregational meeting uh, in order to hear uh, some information uh, about the future ministry and the future ministry opportunity uh, for our church. So I encourage you to be a part of that. It's also our great joy and privilege uh, each week to be able to sing happy birthday to members of our congregation uh, who are going to be celebrating birthdays uh, in the coming week. And uh, so this week we have uh, two, uh, three people who are celebrating birthdays. And the first one that we want to sing happy birthday uh, to is Gary. So happy birthday to Gary. Happy birthday to you.
second person that we want to celebrate with this week is Hisai. So let's sing happy birthday to Hisai. Happy birthday to you. But certainly not least, we want to sing happy birthday to Tanya. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tanya. Happy birthday to you. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this day and every day, world without end. Amen and amen. We'll conclude our worship by singing, May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you. And remember as you go that we love you and that God loves you too. As you love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia.